Three o'clock in the morning. The soft April night is looking in at my windows and caressingly winking at me with its stars. I can't sleep. I'm so happy. My whole being from head to heels is bursting with a strange, incomprehensible feeling. I can't analyze it just now. I haven't the time. I'm too lazy. And there, hang analysis. Why is a man likely to interpret his sensations when he is flying head foremost from a belfry, or has just learned he has won 200,000? Is he in a state to do it? This was more or less how I began my love letter to Sasha, a girl of 19 with whom I had fallen in love. I began it five times, and as often tore up the sheets, scratched out whole pages, and copied it all over again. I spent as long over the letter as if it had been a novel I had to write to order. And it was not because I tried to make it longer, more elaborate, and more fervent, but because I wanted endlessly to prolong the process of this writing. When one sits in the stillness of one's study and communes with one's own daydreams, while the spring night looks in at one's window, between the lines I saw a beloved image, and it seemed to me that there were, sitting at the same table writing with me, spirits as naively happy, as foolish, and as blissfully smiling as I. I wrote continually, looking at my hand, which still ached deliciously where hers had lately pressed it. And if I turned my eyes away, I had a vision of the green trellis of the little gate. Through that trellis, Sasha gazed at me after I had said goodbye to her. When I was saying goodbye to Sasha, I was thinking of nothing, and was simply admiring her figure as every decent man admires a pretty woman. When I saw through the trellis two big eyes, I suddenly, as though by inspiration, knew that I was in love, and that it was all settled between us, and fully decided already that I had nothing left to do but carry out certain formalities. It is a great delight also to seal up a love letter, and slowly, putting on one's hat and coat, to go softly out of the house and to carry the treasure to the post. There are no stars in the sky now. In their place is a long whitish streak in the east, broken here and there by clouds above the roofs of the dingy houses. From that streak the whole sky is flooded with pale light. The town is asleep, but already the water carts have come out, and somewhere in a faraway factory a whistle sounds to wake up the workpeople. Beside the post box, slightly moist with dew, you are sure to see the clumsy figure of a house porter wearing a bell-shaped sheepskin and carrying a stick. He is in a condition akin to catalepsy. He is not asleep or awake, but something between. If the boxes knew how often people resort to them for the decision of their fate, they would not have such an humble air. I, anyway, almost kissed my post box, and as I gazed at it I reflected that the post is the greatest of blessings. I beg anyone who has ever been in love to remember how one usually hurries home after dropping the letter in the box rapidly gets into bed and pulls up the quilt in the full conviction that as soon as one wakes up in the morning, one will be overwhelmed with memories of the previous day and look with rapture at the window, where the daylight will be eagerly making its way through the folds of the curtain. Well, to facts. Next morning at midday, Sasha's maid brought me the following answer. I am delighted. Be sure to come to us today. Please, I shall expect you. Your S. Not a single comma. This lack of punctuation and the misspelling of the word delighted, the whole letter and even the long narrow envelope in which it was put filled my heart with tenderness. In the sprawling but diffident handwriting I recognized Sasha's walk, her way of raising her eyebrows when she laughed, the movement of her lips. But the contents of the letter did not satisfy me. In the first place, poetical letters are not answered in that way, and in the second, why should I go to Sasha's house to wait till it should occur to her stout mamma, her brothers, and poor relations to leave us alone together? It would never enter their heads, and nothing is more hateful than to have to restrain one's raptures simply because of the intrusion of some animate trumpery in the shape of a half-deaf old woman or little girl pestering one with questions. I sent an answer by the maid asking Sasha to select some park or boulevard for a rendezvous. 
my suggestion was readily accepted. I had struck the right chord, as the saying is. Between four and five o'clock in the afternoon, I made my way to the furthest and most overgrown part of the park. There was not a soul in the park, and the tryst might have taken place somewhere nearer in one of the avenues or arbors, but women don't like doing it by halves in romantic affairs. In for a penny, in for a pound. If you were in for a tryst, let it be in the furthest and most impenetrable thicket, where one runs the risk of stumbling upon some rough or drunken man. When I went up to Sasha, she was standing with her back to me, and in that back I could read a devilish lot of mystery. It seemed as though that back and the nape of her neck and the black spots on her dress were saying, Hush! The girl was wearing a simple cotton dress over which she had thrown a light cape. To add to the air of mysterious secrecy, her face was covered with a white veil. Not to spoil the effect, I had to approach on tiptoe and speak in a half-whisper. From what I remember now, I was not so much the essential point of the rendezvous as a detail of it. Sasha was not so much absorbed in the interview itself as in its romantic mysteriousness. My kisses, the silence of the gloomy trees, my vows... There was not a minute in which she forgot herself, was overcome, or let the mysterious expression drop from her face. And really, if there had been any Ivan Sidorich or Sidor Ivanovich in my place, she would have felt just as happy. How is one to make out in such circumstances whether one is loved or not, whether the love is the real thing or not? From the park I took Sasha home with me. The presence of the beloved woman in one's bachelor quarters affects one like wine and music. Usually one begins to speak of the future, and the confidence and self-reliance with which one does so is beyond bounds. You make plans and projects, talk fervently of the rank of general, though you have not yet reached the rank of lieutenant. And although you fire off such high-flown nonsense that your listener must have a great deal of love and ignorance of life to assent to it. Fortunately for men, women in love are always blinded by their feelings and never know anything of life. Far from not assenting, they actually turn pale with holy awe, are full of reverence, and hang greedily on the maniac's words. Sasha listened to me with attention, but I soon detect an absent-minded expression on her face. She did not understand me. The future of which I talked interested her only in its external aspect, and I was wasting time in displaying my plans and projects before her. She was keenly interested in knowing which would be her room, what papers she would have in the room, why I had an upright piano instead of a grand piano, and so on. She examined carefully all the little things on my table, looked at the photographs, sniffed at the bottles, peeled the old stamps off the envelopes, saying she wanted them for something. Please collect old stamps for me, she said, making a grave face. Please do. Then she found a nut in the window, noisily cracked it, and ate it. Why don't you stick little labels on the back of your books, she asked, taking a look at the bookcase. What for? Oh, so that each book should have its number. And where am I to put my books? I've got books too, you know. What books have you got, I asked. Sasha raised her eyebrows, thought a moment, and said, All sorts. And if it had entered my head to ask her what thoughts, what convictions, what aims she had, she would no doubt have raised her eyebrow, thought a minute, and said in the same way, all sorts. Later, I saw Sasha home and left her house regularly, officially engaged, and was so reckoned till our wedding. If the reader will allow me to judge merely from my personal experience, I maintain that to be engaged is very dreary, far more so than to be a husband or nothing at all. An engaged man is neither one thing nor the other. He has left one side of the river and not reached the other. He is not married, and yet he can't be said to be a bachelor but is in something not unlike the condition of the porter whom I have mentioned before. Every day, as soon as I had a free moment, I hastened to my fiancé. As I went, I usually bore within me a multitude of hopes, desires, intentions, suggestions, phrases. I always fancied that as soon as the maid opened the door, I should, from feeling oppressed and stifled, plunge at once up to my neck into a sea of refreshing happiness. But it always turned out otherwise, in fact. 
Every time I went to see my fiance, I found all her family and other members of the household busy over the silly trousseau. And by the way, they were hard at work sewing for two months, and then they had less than a hundred rubles worth of things. There was a smell of irons, candle grease, and fumes. Bugles crunched under one's feet. The two most important rooms were piled up with billows of linen, calico, and muslin, and from among the billows peeped out Sasha's little head with a thread between her teeth. All the sewing party welcomed me with cries of delight, but at once led me off into the dining room where I could not hinder them, nor see what only husbands are permitted to behold. In spite of my feelings, I had to sit in the dining room and, and converse with Pimnovna, one of the poor relations. Sasha, looking worried and excited, kept running by me with a thimble, a skein of wool, or some other boring object. Wait, wait, I shan't be a minute, she would say when I raised imploring eyes to her. Only fancy that wretch Tepanida has spoilt the bodice of the barache dress. And after waiting in vain for this grace, I lost my temper, went out of the house, and walked about the streets in the company of the new cane I had bought. Or I would want to go for a walk or a drive with my fiancé, would go round and find her already standing in the hall with her mother, dressed to go out and playing with her parasol. Oh, we are going to the arcade, she would say. We have got to buy some more cashmere and change the hat. My outing is knocked on the head. I join the ladies and go with them to the arcade. It is revoltingly dull to listen to women shopping, haggling, and trying to outdo the sharp shopman. I felt ashamed when Sasha, after turning over masses of material and knocking down the prices to a minimum, walked out of the shop without buying anything or else told the shopman to cut her some half-rubles worth. When they came out of the shop, Sasha and her mama, with scarred and worried faces, would discuss at length having made a mistake, having bought the wrong thing, the flowers in the chintz being too dark, and so on. Yes, it's a bore to be engaged. I'm glad it's over. Now I'm married. It is evening. I am sitting in my study reading. Behind me on the sofa, Sasha is sitting munching something noisily. I want a glass of beer. Sasha, look for the corkscrew, I say. It's lying about somewhere. Sasha leaps up, rummages in a disorderly way among two or three heaps of papers, drops the matches, and without finding the corkscrew, sits down in silence. Five minutes passed. Ten. I begin to be fretted both by thirst and vexation. Sasha, do look for the corkscrew, I say. Sasha leaps up again and rummages among the papers near me. Her munching and rustling of the papers affects me like the sound of sharpening knives against each other. I get up and begin looking for the corkscrew myself. At last it is found and the beer is uncorked. Sasha remains by the table and begins telling me something at great length. You'd better read something, Sasha, I say. She takes up a book, sits down facing me, and begins moving her lips. I look at her little forehead, moving lips, and sink into thought. She's getting on for twenty, I reflect. If one takes a boy of the educated class and of that age and compares them, what a difference. The boy would have knowledge and convictions and some intelligence. But I forgive that difference just as the low forehead and moving lips are forgiven. I remember in my old Lovelace days I have cast off women for a stain on their stockings, or for one foolish word, or for not cleaning their teeth. And now I forgive everything, the munching, the muddling about after the corkscrew, the slovenliness, the long talking about nothing that matters. I forgive it all almost unconsciously with no effort of will as though Sasha's mistakes were my mistake, and many things which would have made me wince in the old days moved me to tenderness and even rapture. The explanation of this forgiveness of everything lies in my love for Sasha. But what is the explanation of the love itself? I really don't know.